Usually when a franchise hits its 8th entry, you more or less know what the next iteration is going to do. I mean, let's be honest, is Call of Duty Advanced Warfare really going to be a game changer? Is the next Ratchet & Clank game really going to change everything you know about Ratchet & Clank? This is honestly one of the main reasons why I like Nintendo so much. You don't even know what art style the next Zelda game is going to have, that's how much they change up every game. Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, Zelda 2, Link Between Worlds, they all feel familiar and distinctly Zelda-ish, but they all feel like their own thing too, and that's why I also love Mario Kart. Sure, maybe they don't change up the formula quite as much, it's still just a kart racer when you get right down to it, but like I said, Nintendo takes the familiar and spins it on its head, even in its eighth entry. So does the new Mario Kart manage to break new ground and still impress? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's get into Mario Kart 8. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not the biggest Mario Kart fan. Not to say that I don't enjoy them, I really do. Mario Kart Double Dash was one of the first games that I got genuinely addicted to. But I'm gonna be honest, out of the ones that I've played, there are more that I don't like than there are ones that I do. Mario Kart Super Circuit, Mario Kart DS, and especially Mario Kart Wii, I didn't enjoy them. Mario Kart Wii just felt toned down in every aspect. The colours were less colourful, the speed was less speedy, the tracks weren't as impressive, but they were a lot wider for some reason. I don't know, I just get bored by it whenever I play it. I guess to put it best, it felt like it was lacking personality. It felt kind of by the numbers and didn't really seem to stand out. But anyway, enough about that. Mario Kart 8. It seemed pretty clear right from the get-go that this game was going to rectify a lot of the problems I had with Mario Kart Wii. The colours looked brighter, the gameplay looked faster. I mean, look at that right there, you fall off the stage, the key to picture right back up and off you go, bada bing, bada boom, right there. The tracks looked more varied, everything that I wanted in the first place. It kind of reminded me of Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, a game that I much prefer to Mario Kart Wii. It was just a lot more hectic, more competitive, more fast, just a lot better in my opinion. It was also the first thing I ever reviewed on this channel as a matter of fact. Maybe you should watch it. Oh, don't actually, it's pretty terrible. But of course, I'm yet to bring up the main selling point of this game. Mario Kart 7 on the 3DS introduced racing on different terrains, such as driving underwater and gliding through the air. It mixed up the gameplay pretty nicely and allowed for a lot of creative level design. These new mechanics were carried over to Mario Kart 8 and were only made even cooler with the new gravity mechanic. Now, although I'm not going to pretend that I've never seen anti-gravity in a kart racer before, Nintendo really used it to its full potential. Driving around on the walls and on the ceiling is amazing. It's a pretty awesome feeling seeing other racers above you as you race against them. I mean, they're above you, but they're also below you. You're the one on the ceiling, but they're above you, but they're on the ground. It's just so disorientating, but so cool. It's honestly like playing Mario Galaxy for the first time all over again. Your mind has to adjust to this gravity mechanic at first. By this point, it feels like Nintendo could do literally anything with these ideas. And the tracks shown in the game are only scratching the surface of what they could do later on. Another point that I feel like needs to be made, and I don't care who hears it, Mario Kart 8 is the most next-gen looking game I've ever played. Yeah, I'm dropping that bombshell right now. Mario Kart 8 uses colour, lighting, and particle effects to create some bloody outstanding visuals that rival even the likes of Infamous Second Son and Killzone Shadow 4. Who knew that a cartoony game could look better than a photorealistic one? Hmm, smug, smug. Just the sun shining in the pink blue sky in Moo Moo Meadows. Just the water reflecting off the road in Donut Plains 3. Just the droplets of water in Dolphin Shoals. Just the view of planet Earth and space in Rainbow Road. Just Mario's moustache waggling in the breeze. I dare you to deny that this is a next-gen experience through and through. The music too is pretty incredible. Just listen to that Moo Moo Meadows music. Can't more games have an orchestral score? Oh yeah, because they're not Nintendo. Oh, well I was gonna do a whole thing here about the Dolphin Shoals music sounding like a cheesy 80s sitcom. You know, just like a little quick sketch of me like acting out an intro to a sitcom with the music in the background, but I'm too lazy. As for the online mode, I'll be honest, I never really played it that much. Mostly to stop myself from getting addicted more than anything else. From what I played though, it was okay. Apart from a bit of loading when you first start up, I don't really have any problems. There was no lag, no delay, no nothing. 
I liked it. But with all the praise and compliments I'm giving to the game, there comes the inevitable question. Are there any criticisms to outweigh the praise? Well, maybe. There are a few things about this game that does kind of suck. First off is something that I haven't seen anyone else complain about. So this is more than likely a total non-issue that only I find annoying, but I still feel like it needs bringing up. No restart function. Now, I know that might sound like a little bit of a nitpick, but when you're in the final lap of the final race of the final Grand Prix that you have to do in the 150cc and you're just about to win until some guy, usually Toad or Waluigi or someone annoying like that, overtakes you at the last second, claiming the trophy for himself and you want to restart that individual race and you can't do that because you only have the option to restart the entire Grand Prix from the start, that's really annoying in my opinion. Now I get that it makes it more tense and it makes winning all that more satisfying, but that doesn't mean that I can't complain about it. It feels like an artificial way to make your game feel longer than it really is, and that's annoying to me. Even bloody Dark Souls has checkpoints sometimes. Evolve. I feel like I should make it clear right off the bat that this might not be the most helpful review for quite a few reasons. Truth be told, I knew next to nothing about this game up until playing it for myself. I mean, I knew the general gist of the gameplay and I'd heard about a few of its features and mechanics, and I'd heard quite a few good things about the developer to All Rock Studios, but as for any real details, I went into this game almost completely blind. So it wasn't until I actually received the game in the post when I realised quite how multiplayer heavy the game itself is, which wouldn't really be so much of a problem, except I don't have PlayStation Plus anymore. Probably should have looked into that before I got it. Oh well. And the worst thing is, I was totally going to buy a new membership and everything, especially now that I'm reviewing games again, but then the buttons on my PS4 controller started jamming and sticking. Yeah, that's not supposed to sound like that. I tried opening the back with as many screwdrivers as I could possibly find and buy, and then just trying whatever I could find in the vain hope that something would eventually happen. But in the end, I had no choice but to get a new controller for 50 quid, which in my opinion is pretty bloody insane. The point is, here I am today reviewing a multiplayer-oriented game with no access to the online mode. Blame Sony for their extortionate prices and stupidly small screws. The story of Evolve centres around the planet Shear, a distant planet in the distant future that humanity has travelled to because reasons, I guess. But on that planet, they also find a variety of monsters who begin to attack their colonies and resources. So this guy assembles a team of hunters, consisting of war veterans, psychopaths, professionals and expendables, to find these monsters and eliminate them. All of this is established in a quick 30 second cutscene when you first load up the game and then never really delved into again. It more or less just serves as a shell for the rest of the game, which I guess is okay given the context. There's no single player campaign, or really any campaign at all for that matter, so what we really need is a beat outline and we're good. Saying that though, I definitely feel like more could have been done with the four playable characters. It kind of gives off the impression that they wanted to be the next Left 4 Dead or Team Fortress 2, but without any of the real charm or wit. And I know that it's a multiplayer oriented game, so the game might not have that many opportunities to establish characters because there's no campaign or cutscene or anything like that, but that didn't stop Team Fortress 2 or Left 4 Dead, so what's stopping this game? And it doesn't make sense, because a lot of Turtle Rock Studios is made up of ex-Valve employees, so why in terms of writing doesn't it feel like it? If you've ever seen one of my Let's Plays on Farfetch Plays... Oh god, oh god, no no no! Oh, Idiot. My older content on Farfetch for dinner. Oh no. No way. No way. No. I I no. No. Or some of my live streams on Twitch, you'll soon learn one thing. I'm not very good at playing games. Pretty damn terrible as a matter of fact. Oh no, oh no, I didn't think they'd be all- It's because of this that I never really quite got into Oddworld Apes Odyssey on the PS1. And when I say that I never really quite got into them, that isn't to say that I didn't enjoy them. I really, really did. The Oddworld games are amazing. I just mean that I never got very far in them because I'm not very good at the Oddworld games, if you couldn't already tell. I've tried to play the PS1 version time and time and time again, each time getting a little bit far 
rather than the last. But there came a point where I just had to admit defeat. 